Sansian Island, six miles off the coast of China, 1552. In the east, the great kingdom sealed themselves off against the tide of European expansion that brought menacing strangers with their foreign god. In the west, European men of fortune prepared to pry their way into these new worlds with the tools of war, the mechanisms of commerce, and even, sadly, with the tenets of their Christian faith. This is the story of one man who had ventured to these faraway lands for reasons few understood, who traveled, not with a battalion or a bill of trade, but with a simple message of invitation and grace. This is the story of a missionary who died alone on a desolate island within sight of the land of his life's dream, unaware that he had forever changed the face and the race of Christianity. This is Francis Xavier. Francis Xavier, the man who came to be known as the Apostle to the East and hailed as the greatest missionary since the time of Christ's own apostles, began life in the backwater kingdom of Navarre in northern Spain. The 16th century brought a wave of excitement to Europe as explorers crisscrossed the shrinking globe and artists created with a passion unrivaled since antiquity. But the boy Francis knew none of it. He was born in 1506 to parents who, like rural Navarre itself, persisted in the well-worn ways of an older era. His father served in the king's court, his sister entered a convent, and his older brothers took up the swords of chivalry. It was a typical late medieval family. The Javier family was a noble family, an important family of the kingdom of Navarre, and Francis grew up in a noble household with a noble education, and he would have been expected to become, of course, a nobleman and a knight himself. But as Spain consolidated into an empire under King Ferdinand, the tiny outlying kingdom of Navarre and the Xaviers along with it were increasingly left out of imperial politics. Then the Xavier family endured a barrage of staggering calamities. When Francis was nine years old, his father died, leaving the family helpless and at the mercy of the aggrieved Spanish king. After Spanish troops imprisoned Francis' brothers, Francis and his mother eked out a living among the castle's ruins, and the high-born boy found himself cutting logs down the river at the family mill. But old ways die hard. The youngest sons of medieval families typically served the church as a priest or a monk. So Francis left his family, left the mill, his brothers, and what was left of the castle to study for the priesthood. A post in the church would bring much needed stability to the Xaviers. After ordination, Francis would return to Navarre and collect a nice salary. It was a plum job and the fast track towards recapturing some of the family's former prestige and honor and wealth, especially if he were to become a bishop, an archbishop, or a cardinal, a prince of the church. So in 1525, the 19-year-old Francis left home for college. In Paris, he would take a course of theology and philosophy in preparation for the priesthood. He'd also get a taste of all that Europe's most cosmopolitan city could offer. By all accounts, Francis was a medieval frat boy. He made fast friends with a group of students and teachers notorious for their hard drinking, womanizing, and generally running amok. Relying mainly on native talent, Francis survived the rigors of college life and earned a degree. Soon it would be time to return to Sleepy Navarre for ordination to the priesthood. 
Xavier and his pious roommate, Peter Faber, both 24, made way for a new and unusual student. A 38-year-old Hidalgo turned beggar, recently kicked out of his own digs because of his reckless ministry to plague victims. To make matters worse, the new boarder was a Spaniard who had fought on the victorious side of the same war that had ruined the Saviors. His name was Ignatius. After his military career was cut short by a nearly fatal injury from a cannonball, Ignatius underwent a radical conversion. He renounced his wealth and nobility, and then begged door to door, preached in the streets, and guided people through an ordeal he called the spiritual exercises. He came to Paris not to advance a career, but simply to gain the academic credentials needed to avoid the Inquisition. In Paris, these men gathered around Ignatius, attracted to him by his personality. Somehow or other, he had this great gift of winning deep devotion on the part of many of those with whom he came into contact. Francis kept his distance from Ignatius and his band of devoted do-gooders. But all that quickly changed. A drinking buddy of Xavier's crowd was hanged to death on the gallows for killing a man in a fight, his third offense. A professor and close friend contracted syphilis during one of their midnight romps and died an excruciating death. Then Francis ran out of money again. Desperate and desolate, he turned to the last resort. Ignatius helped Francis with a little money and then set to work on tougher problems. Xavier began to trust Ignatius and even experienced the spiritual exercises firsthand. Ignatius and his exercises had rescued Xavier from the self-serving path back to medieval Navarre, a flowery title and comfortable boredom. Francis admitted that he owed Ignatius his very life. Ignatius and his band of friends, Xavier among them, joined in a mission to save souls. They vowed eternal poverty and chastity, then resolved to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to visit the holy places of Jesus' life and convert the Muslims in possession of the Holy Land. The perennial war with the Turks in the east prevented Xavier and company from going further than Venice. So they turned to Rome the center of Western Christianity. They came at the time of the pontificate of Pope Paul III, Alessandro Farnese, who came from a wealthy old Italian family. The Pope enjoyed Ignatius and his Paris-trained scholars. Their simple lifestyle and infectious enthusiasm impressed the aging pontiff. He gave the group his blessing and made them an official order within the Catholic Church. They called themselves the company of Jesus. After they were ordained as priests, they worked in the streets of Rome, searching out people who were most in need. The young company, better known as the Jesuits, stirred the souls of 16th century Rome and transformed the way Europeans thought about God, educated their children, and even the way they prayed. Word of the new order reached all quarters of Europe, Many bishops and kings petitioned the Pope for Jesuits, and he dispersed them all over the New World alongside Europe's most noted explorers. The King of Portugal wanted Jesuits to staff his budding mission in India. Ignatius agreed to send two men, but illness rendered one of them unable to endure the journey to India. With no other men available, Xavier was the only man left. In April 1541, with a teeming imagination, Xavier left Europe in a caravan of ships from Lisbon. He promptly presented himself to the Bishop of Goa, the Patriarch of India. Xavier declined the comfortable quarters due to him at the Bishop's palace in favor of the local hospital for the incurables. As Xavier tended to the needs of the poorest of the Indian Christians, he discovered that they had been subjected to a drive-through baptism and then simply left to the devices of the corrupt colonial powers. 
After seeing the extent of the need, he devised a plan to educate those already baptized and to convert those not yet received into the faith. Xavier trekked from village to village sharing the Christian message. Legend holds he baptized tens of thousands of people, often thousands at the same time. Xavier noticed that whole segments of the Indian population seemed cool to his message, and worse, repulsed by his person. Xavier either ignored or misunderstood the dynamics of the Hindu caste system. Xavier's refusal to deal realistically with the caste system and his ambivalence toward the Portuguese led him to despair over India. He left the country and for two years traveled all over southern Asia. His journeys took him to the booming city of Malacca, a crossroads where sailors from all over the Far East and the Islamic world met. And in Malacca, he met for the first time people who claimed to be from a large nation of wise and civil lords. He suddenly hears about this sophisticated kingdom with a courtly and knightly structure that is so like um, late medieval Spain as to be, you know, really quite bewildering in, in, its, in its similarities with a great knightly cast and great princes. Xavier met a young sailor named Anhiro. Under Xavier's guidance, Anhiro became Christian. He regaled Xavier with stories about his homeland, the land called Sipango by Marco Polo, now known as Japan. Anhiro told Xavier that if he spoke well and replied satisfactorily to their questions and lived beyond reproach, within half a year the king and nobility and all the other prudent people in the land would become Christians. Xavier immediately wanted to go to Japan. When Xavier arrived, no Westerner had ever ventured inland beyond one or two of the country's ports. The Japanese, still wary of the bearded riffraff who washed up occasionally on the southern shores, called the Europeans the Southern Barbarians. Xavier brought the Japanese convert Anhiro along with him to help translate and to win his entry into the country. They entered in the south of the country, disguised in a Chinese pirate junk, and then traveled to Yamaguchi, Anhiro's native town, where the local lord graciously allowed them to stay. Xavier and Anhiro began teaching the Christian faith using the same techniques Xavier had pioneered throughout India and Indonesia. He lived with the poor people, clothed in a threadbare cassock and shoeless. But in the larger cities, Xavier and Anhiro encountered resistance from the monks, nobles and intellectuals, whose support would be necessary if they were to convert the masses. On Anhiro's advice, Xavier set out on a mission to see the Emperor of Japan, whom he would beg for permission to preach the gospel throughout the entire dominion. Xavier nurtured the secret hope of gaining the Emperor's own conversion. Upon arriving in Kyoto, Xavier waited in line for days to see the Emperor, the man he hoped would serve as a sort of Asian Constantine. But he soon learned the truth about the so-called Emperor. The Emperor ruled in name only. He, was, he held no power outside of Kyoto itself. He was merely a figurehead. At this point, Xavier's failure seemed complete. He couldn't learn the language. He had made little headway with the learned Japanese, and he had taken a futile trip to see a puppet emperor. His dream was vanishing. He retreated to the south, perhaps to get on a boat and return to India, or even to return home. On his way, Xavier had an epiphany that would forever change his life, his church, and the world. Xavier realized that his old method, traveling as a poor, humble beggar, living amongst the poorest of the poor, was not the best way to spread Christianity in a culture as refined as the Japanese. When Xavier returned to Yamaguchi from Kyoto, he took off his humble robes of a monk, put on his vice-regal insignia, 
and his best cape and went back to the palace of the Lord of Yamaguchi. We gave the Duke of Yamaguchi some letters which we had brought from the governor and the bishop and also some gifts as a token of our friendship. We wanted to preach the law of God in his land. He very graciously granted us permission and then ordered placards to be set up in the streets stating he was pleased with our preaching. Xavier began talking about non-religious subjects. He slowed down and got to know the Japanese. He introduced them to Western math, science, and geography. They even talked about the weather. They did not know that the world was round, nor did they know the course of the sun. They asked about comets, lightning, rain, and snow, and similar phenomena. They were very satisfied with our replies and explanations. Francis wanted to ask what people thought. Francis wanted to talk to people. And for Francis, conversation always preceded conversion. Becoming less strange to the Japanese facilitated the exchange of ideas, and ultimately the idea of Xavier's God. But now, in terms that would be more congenial to the Japanese. He even starts trying to accommodate the Christian message to Japanese language. He seeks specifically Japanese Buddhist words to describe God, the heaven, the angels, and so on. Now he's translating much more fundamentally. He's getting inside uh, uh, Japanese culture and life. His new method met with an unprecedented success. When he gets to Japan, he makes a decisive break with enormous importance, both for the Society of Jesus, but also for Christian mission, that you can be Christian outside European culture, and there can be a Christian culture that isn't a European culture. Xavier was the architect of a notion that is now commonplace, that there could be authentic non-European Christians. But for Francis Xavier, Japan was not enough. With the country in civil strife, a widespread conversion was impossible. Thanks to his contact in Japan with a number of learned monks, Xavier heard of another, more ancient country, and so yet another dream took shape. Xavier set his eyes to the headwaters of Asian culture, to China. In comparison to China, Japan seemed like an open house. Unwelcome visitors, Westerners in particular, were imprisoned, tortured, and often executed. The Chinese had no desire for uh, contact with Europe beyond very basic trade contacts. August 1552. Xavier landed on the tiny island of Sancion within sight of the Chinese mainland. From there, Portuguese merchants trafficked with Chinese pirates. Xavier scrambled to get to China by any means possible. He begged, he bribed, he threatened. But no one was willing to risk certain death of court. Days passed, then weeks, then months. With the coming of winter, most of the Portuguese fleet fled for India. All of Xavier's companions deserted him, except for one Chinese translator, Anthony, who had been gone from China for so long that he forgot the language. Eventually, Xavier found a Chinese merchant willing to ferry him across to Canton in exchange for nearly two tons of pepper, a small fortune. The day of the rendezvous came and went. Xavier kept watch from his desolate beachside hut, waking day after day to an empty horizon. On the island itself, he ministered to sick merchantmen left behind to die. On a cold November morning, after saying a funeral mass for a Portuguese trader, Xavier returned to his lean-to and came down with a fever. He was bled several times. For a week, Xavier passed in and out of consciousness while Anthony scrounged for food. The remaining ships weighed anchor for India and according to legend, left the two men with only a handful of almonds between them. December 3rd, 1552. 
Stuck between two nowheres, the failing missions behind him and the unknown potential before him, Xavier died. Although the story of European exploration often tells of tragic misunderstandings and murderous ignorance, Xavier's is a different story. Xavier conceived his vocation as a pioneer to, to open the doors so that others could come in. Ambivalently accepted in life, Xavier was everywhere welcomed in death. On the journey back to Goa, Francis' corpse was widely honored as it retraced his missionary steps from island to island. Miracles were ascribed to his intercession almost immediately. Europeans voraciously read his letters, which contained the best information on Asia to reach Europe since Marco Polo. Today, 500 years later, Xavier's popularity has only intensified. Millions of Indians, Hindus, Muslims and Christians alike make frequent pilgrimage to Goa to pay tribute to the man they revere as a saint. Throughout the world, churches, high schools, universities bear his name. In the United States, the name appears in the most diverse of circumstances, Xavier University. And even Charles Francis Xavier, Professor X of the fictional X-Men. Jesuit missionaries eventually fulfill Xavier's dream of reaching the Chinese emperor, with whom they initiated a cultural exchange between East and West, that had no precedent then and perhaps no rival now. Within 50 years of Xavier's death, Jesuits were serving as China's foremost mathematicians, linguists and geographers. Rather than a quest for world domination, Xavier's mission was an expansion of the heart, an opening of the mind, a discovery of love. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. These words of Jesus are easy to understand, but at the moment of death, their meaning becomes obscure. And no matter how learned you may be, you will only understand when God reveals the meaning in his infinite mercy. Entirely yours. Francisco. <laughs>